Now on one, it's on the other side of the world, but parts of Newfoundland are just like home, as presenter ne Liam Nolan discovers for Small World. I'm here on the western edge of Ireland, an island in crisis, an island feeling truly battered. But a full 2,000 miles that way is another Irish community that's faced its own battles and lived to tell the tale. I'm heading to a hidden spot on a remote island way off the eastern coast of Canada. There's a very good chance that Tilting is the most Irish community outside of Ireland. As strange as it might be to understand, I'm about to encounter a small town of Madford Irish people who've never set foot in Ireland. And although you may not have heard of this place until now, there are stories out here which prove that this really is a small world. So here we go, tilting, the top right edge of Fogo Island. If I keep going, next stop, Greenland. I would say it's certainly not the edge of the world, but people have to work hard to settle here. It was home to some of the first settlers in North America. The Portuguese, French, English came and left, yet one small group from the southeast of Ireland arrived in the 1700s and kept this town for themselves. I've come here because of a series of old films I discovered deep in the archive of the Canadian Film Board. In 1967, the lives of Tilting residents were captured on camera at a time when their island community was threatened by plans to resettle people onto the mainland. On release, the documentaries had an immediate and profound effect on a generation of Tilting folk. Let's do it. Are we going to hold it, Jeff? Yeah? Come back this way. No, no. Jump, jump in there. I want to meet them and find out how they and their Irish family survived. I want to see what has changed and what has remained since those once famous but now forgotten films were made. Now, as it was on film, I see Irish flags, Connemara's landscape and St. Patrick himself. But the key facts about Tilting are it's provincially run by Newfoundland and is part of the federal state of Canada. I'm guessing, though, there are people here that would prefer not to see it that way. This is Leo Burke, permanent resident of Tilting. We keep on going, you go right to Ireland. I am Irish. Really Irish. <laughs> Everybody tells me I am. So I must be, if everybody tells me I am, I got to be Irish. Got the Irish name, Irish accent, everything that goes with it. <laughs> this is a piece of uh, an iceberg that uh, came from way up north, and I picked it up out here in the ocean. And what I'm going to do with it, all you need is a little a needle. You can beat that up in a million pieces with the top of a needle. And I'll stick a needle in it or a sharp knife and the pieces come out of it. And I'll drop it down <coughs> in a glass and half fill it with lamb's rum. And perfect drink. <laughs> Leo Burke is married to Rosemary, who apparently was also a Burke when they first got together. You're both Burks. Yeah. But this was you were from the Burks on this side of the yes. yeah. of Tilting. Yes. Rosemary's from the Burks on the other yeah. side of Tilting. Yeah. Is there any relation between these Burks and the Burks on the other side? Oh yeah. Distantly, Dist yes. Distant, yeah. Yeah. How has the island managed to keep its traditional way of life going? We don't associate. Uh, it's not that we don't associate with other people, but we stick together. You know, a lot of us, we live here and we're not in much contact with other people. You know, there aren't anyone else living in Tilting besides people who have lived here for 300 years. And 
it's because of that the, the people here haven't lost their accent. We're just as Irish as you are, you know? We haven't changed. We haven't been anywhere to change. Did you ever visit Ireland? No, I didn't, but I want to. Yeah, I'm going sometime. When I can afford it. You don't want to pay my way, do you? <laughs> <laughs> stick together in Tilting. They all have their own separate patch. Over there is the green quarter. The Dwyers are over there. Here you got the Burks. Then you got the McGraths over here, originally from Balnagulke County, Waterford. And over there, almost as big as the McGraths, are the Foley's. 250 years ago, the Foley's and McGraths arrived here. Today, they're by far the two biggest families in the town, adding up to half its total population. Looking back at the films, it becomes clear how they managed to survive for so long in such an isolated part of the world, the fisheries. Leo McGrath is the seventh generation of fishermen in the McGrath family. He has moved with the times and faced up to the constant challenges of modern day fishing. In the past decade, he took out a big loan for a new boat so he could move into deep sea crab fishing. Well, we fished out to 165 miles in this boat. 24 hours I was 30 hours back. So when you went out there, whatever the weather was, then you just took it. Fishing was always a gamble. Leo borrowed a million dollars for the boat and is yet to see a proper return on it. His life at sea is at a tipping point where a bad fishing year will be hard to recover from. He's offered to take me out with his crew on one of their offshore fishing trips. How far are we going out? 55 mile or somewhere around there, eh? Well, what's the plan? Well, we go out and pile the pots. Probably be gone for two days. Take what's in them and bring it back. So if you're in a class that is successful, how much do you have to catch in the whole season? Well, we have 60,000 pound of crab to catch. So we can get that with the price it is. The price is 2.27 a pound, Canadian. And uh, with that, we can make a pretty good year. During the bad fishing years, Leo and other fishermen used to hunt seals near the Arctic on the off-season. It provided money in the lean months, but in 2009, a European ban on seal products took that income away. I, I don't think very much of it. I don't think very much of it. The way, the way it was all handled, and it was a part of our livelihoods, a part of our income, a major part of our income, in fact. But anyway, that's all behind us now. A seal hunt is not a pretty, is not a pretty hunt. Any slaughter is not nice. But where the seal was slaughtered on wheat ice, and the size then of Red blood on white ice don't look nice. East coast, north of Cape St. Francis. Gale warning in effect. Wind light, increasing to south. Two five knots Thursday morning. Yeah, hey boys, we're turning back. Right? Yeah, bad weather. Bad weather. Forecast after changing. Night for 35 now or something like that. Leo has reacted to changing times, but one thing that has never changed, the gamble he takes in the weather. We're seven miles out when we get bad news. We were meant to be going out for two or three days, but Leo's just got a weather forecast and apparently it's far too stormy out there. It's okay now because it's, it's, it's calm, but if we got out there by midnight tonight, it would just be far too stormy to fish. So he's made the call, we're coming back in and we're going back into land, unfortunately. We can keep going on out, uh, but uh, there's no sense of being out there if I can't work. Well, last year we only made six trips to catch our quota. And this year now we're on our sixth trip. 
We only got a third of it. Yeah. Well, we got uh, we got 40,000 pounds of crab left in the water. So we, we got two weeks to catch it. And this week is gone, you can say, or yeah. with the weather and that. Heading back to land, it becomes apparent that Leo sees the end in sight, not only for this season's catch, but for his family's fishing life. None of his children are fishermen. When you look at the history of, of us, uh, the Mariahs and everything, uh, I know when I sail this enterprise, it's going to break my heart to know that uh, I will be one of the last Mariahs to have it. Did you want them to go onto the sea? Uh, I never encouraged them, no. No. It's, uh, if they got a better life, Times are tough, but Leo's story, like the Islanders, is one of overcoming the odds. This is not the first time that the future for the McGraths, the fishermen, and all the other families in the island was under threat. It was a renowned Canadian filmmaker, Colin Lowe, that made the films that brought me to this place. Charmed by the unique ways of the Fogo Islanders, he decided to document their daily lives. Only in hindsight would he know he had filmed the community at a make or break moment. The one film he produced that really caught my eye was The Children of Fogo. It showed the island at its most youthful, natural, and blissfully unaware of the growing pressures around them. Fisherman Len McGrath and his brother Jim remember the time well. They have invited me onto their boat to help out with their daily lobster pot collection. Len, Jim, how are you? Oh, not too bad. Can I hop on board? Sure. Sure. Get your sea legs? I don't know. I'll find out soon enough. You want to do it? Yeah, give us a go. <laughs> what do I need to do? Okay, keep it open like this. Yeah? Yeah? Now. So where do I catch his claws? Don't put it in the middle because you'll chew off your finger. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're a freaking wimp. There, and, yeah. uh, and just like now that. Open it up, open it up. Yeah. Go in with it. Yeah, now. Turn it sideways. Like there that. you go, yeah. Twist it, twist it. There, there we go. go. Perfect. <laughs> Sparty. Not gonna make any money this morning, boys. Huh? Do you remember the children of Fogo and all the films that were made here years ago? Lynn should tell you about that one. He was on it. Yeah. The kite flying, was it? That one you're talking about? And, and the stilts. And the stilts, yeah. So that was a big pastime in tilting flying kites and then uh, walking around on stilts. You know what I'm talking about? Get a couple of sticks and you put a piece of board on the side of it and up you goes and you'd walk all around the community on the stilts. Were you in the film itself? Oh, yes, I was in the film. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that was, uh, that was something big back then. You know, we weren't used to seeing anything like that around here. And there wasn't a lot of cars here, then, Jim, were they? Uh, no. What? No, there wasn't. What was special about those films? Well, uh, I mean, the people saw, just like uh, the, the, the mirror was reversed and you could see what was going on, you know, and, and they looked and they saw what life was like. And I think they started to see, I think they appreciated what they had more than what they did before. As kids in 1967, Len and Jim were destined to be uprooted from their homes. The Newfoundland government on the mainland felt the island was an expense not worth bearing. The lives captured on film seemed to challenge that idea. Rosemary Burke was another one of the children of Fogo. Her mother Bridgie remembers the threat to the whole island. Do you remember those films when they were being shot on the island? Do you remember the children of Fogo? Yes, I do. remember it very well. I was one of the children. We would kind of do things that we always did here to show them what we could do. 
What kind of thing? Well, we'd um, some of the boys would be building ca little camps, Walk and they stilts. would walk. Uh, you know, we'd have stilts and. Um, Maybe bikes or bikes and that, and you know, we just want to show them what we could do. I've heard that there was a possibility that the island was going to be resettled. When they came in, they were going to close it down. They didn't want the people living out here because it was too too expensive to keep them out here, I suppose, and get them wherever there was work, you know. Yeah, I remember that. I, yeah. I know they had meetings up there in the school and everyone wasn't satisfied for it. They said they were still going to stay here. But the people on Fogo Island are strong people and, uh, you know, no one is telling them what to do. Back then, unemployment was at 60% and individual fishermen were struggling to survive. The threats of resettlement and extinction drove the islanders to a unique solution. All the local fishermen formed a cooperative and went into business together. As a young boy, Gerald Reardon was one of the children of Fogo. For him, the formation of the co-op meant that his childhood home would become a place where he could spend his life. Be careful now, you don't break your leg. <laughs> You're not used to rocks like this in Ireland, are you? I'd say, yeah. Uh... Right down in here now is where we built the, the little cabin. If you've seen the film, the children of Fogo Island, you'll see on the, on the film where we were trying to get it into place. The foundation into place. Watch the rocks. Go down, come on ahead this way. And it was right about here, somewhere here. We, uh, we set up the little cabin. As a child, Gerald wanted to follow the family tradition of fishing. He now knows this could never have been possible without the groundbreaking actions of the fishermen. The co-op came into play then. The people here, the, the, the adamant fishermen here at the time, they got together and uh, said, no, we're not going to resettle. We're going to start a cooperative. And uh, we're going to fish like we always did, only we're going to get some bigger boats and some more gear and, and address the new way of fishing. And uh, it became reality and we're here yet today. We've got two big high schools at the, at the centre of the island now, and a stadium, and... Those films are still important to you? Oh, yes, they are, yeah. I got them, as a matter of fact. Do you watch them often? I don't watch them often, no, but every now and again, yeah. Pull up a beer and plug in the film and have a gander at it. You know, uh, Callan Lowe really uh, brought us to the rest of Canada, you know, in, in my perspective. We were here then living in Tilting and uh, we didn't have a whole lot of exposure to the rest of the world, you know. The people of Tilting survived and thrived thanks to the co-op. But Tilting is in transition again. This time, not from outside powers, but from within. Modern fishing kept people like Gerald, the McGrath brothers and Leo Burke on the island, but all of their children have left. I want to find out what life can be like for the young people of Tilton that remain here. 18-year-old Siobhan Rose Foley recently graduated from the local high school. She is one of the few teenagers that I could find in Tilton. So what do you do as a, as a teenager here in Tilton? It's very quiet, but that's the way I like it too. So you don't have to worry about walking up the road and a car coming and running you over. You can just walk in the middle of the road. I notice when you speak your, your accent isn't as strong. No, the older people have a uh, way stronger accent. <laughs> I guess like the generations, as you go through the generations, it just disappears. Siobhan is an only child. Her father Phil worked in construction on mainland Canada till he was able to come back home whilst Mother Maureen works in the local high school. You don't think I look Irish? Well, no, not really, because you've got no freckles. No, but when you speak, of course. Well, they remind me of any Irish mother, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I get that a lot. I do. It, Phil? Maureen was already a Foley when she married Phil. He grew up with five brothers, 
all of whom still live close by. They were the first generation to see a proper road run into tilting. They were more isolated than we are now, of course, because there's nobody isolated now. But we kept all the old traditions and we intermarried and, you know. So, Siobhan, are you going to marry a foley or a <laughs> Neither. No. I don't think so. Nobody knows. Who knows? <laughs> Nothing about that yet. <laughs> But people have married in the past. Foley's have married yeah, in the grass. Was... Foley's have married Foley's. Yeah. Burns have married Burks. Because there are so many of them. That's true. Matters like only like I have about five close guy friends in Tilting. That's probably like in our group. No. Well, no more. Oh, uh, well, six or seven. Yeah, but <laughs> no, like it, we're close friends. You would never ever like date anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be so sure. I know. <laughs> never I know. say never, never right? Say never. No. <laughs> That's right. Do you bless yourself? Yes. That's Ireland itself has had big changes, right? Mm -hmm. It has. Big changes, yeah. So, whereas as a little small piece of Ireland over here by ourselves, we've stayed the same kind. We've done all the changes. Mm. Right? We didn't get the changes you got. When I was her age, what was it like? In our community here, it's the 600 people, 700 people. Today, we only got 200 people. So. Yep. Yeah, it's quite a dramatic And children are everywhere, right? Mm. Her generation, well, I mean, not much that. work around, is there, like, you know? So they go to school and get an education and move on elsewhere. Later that night, Phil took me out to the shed that he's trying to make into a pub. Is there no pub in Tilting? No. It's closed down. It's still there, but uh, we, we uh, don't be open very often. Eh? You know, it wasn't viable to give it up, you know. Only for special occasions. Iceberg ice! Iceberg ice, you're the best. Is your wife going to be too pleased with you? Oh, you're she like, don't care. You're lads gathering here. So long as I got diaries with me, I don't have a worry. <laughs> Did the lads gather here every evening? Oh, yes, pretty well, yeah, yeah, yeah. More than this sometimes. You know, in the weekend, boy, get some music. Why don't get the guitar? You want a guitar or what? Why not? Is you a good singer? Yeah. Oh, yes. This is my home. So that makes us little. And the fact that they came here and, and stayed, the French came and English came, but they didn't stay. And the Irish came and stayed. So, and we're still here. And we're not going anywhere. Unless sort of Ireland to visit you. <laughs> Down to St. Patrick's To a show Mom is very hopeful about the future of Fogel Island and stuff and tilting, um, and I think they would really want me to come back. Siobhan Rose Foley is due to go to St. John's University on Newfoundland Island in a couple of months. All the young people that I know from tilting went to university or college or something. It's very important, especially if you want to have a uh, future, I guess. <laughs> As of now, I don't see a lot of us coming back. I would, I'd like to, but I know like a few of my friends are not going to come back. As much as they love home, there's just not a lot for them here.
This small patch on the Atlantic landscape has plotted a community's Irishness and kept families bound tight. It's the story of the Irish in crisis, but with Ireland nowhere in sight. The people of Tilting drive pickup trucks and drink Canadian, and when it comes down to it, it's the province of Newfoundland that sees their taxes and educates the children of Fogel today. In many ways, I feel people here are closer to their Irish heritage than I would be. It's hard to believe they've been living here 200 years, and yet the same expressions that, that we use are still here and alive and well. Like the whole shebang, and give it a lash. It's like a little time warp of Ireland, just encapsulated in that little town down there. Next time on Small World, Anne-Marie McNerney heads east to the Ukraine and discovers an Irish dancing craze that's sweeping the former Soviet state off its feet. And next Friday's episode of Small World is the final of the series. Up next on One, it's the ITU News. 